welcome to the SAP on Energy video podcast. Um, today is April 1st and this is episode 35. Together with um, Robert and Goran, we are here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> So in our last show, we already had Martin, Martin Pankratz joining us and talking about um, the Power App and how to automate an SAP system. And today he joins us again, and this time he will talk about um, blue-green deployments with the SAP Cloud, with the SAP Business Technology Platform. Ah, we but, got you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, before we go over to you, um, we'll again take a quick look at um, <laughs> some of the news from this week. So what I want to start with is um, an update from Bertram Ganz. Um, so for quite a few years now, I think, and Bertram has created um, a nice um, PowerPoint presentation with lots of um, icons and um, diagrams that you can use to build architectures. Um, and obviously with the renaming um, from SAP Cloud Platform to Business Technology Platform. Um, there are a lot of updates there. And yeah, again, he updated um, his PowerPoint presentation. And now you can get the latest and greatest um, icons and solution diagrams to build your uh, SAP Business Technology Platform diagrams. So I think that's definitely something um, worth checking out. Um, <laughs> The next thing is um, we're currently in this in this time of year where we get all the Forrester wave reports on. Yeah, I think we, we last time we talked about the power platform or the low code um, area. And now we're talking about um, functions, functions as a service. And in this Forrester wave, um, Microsoft was named a leader um, in the um, function area. So you might have heard about Azure functions. Um, I think um, here um, Christian Lechner from uh, the My News Rep um, uh, podcast that he has. I think he's also a big fan on Azure Function. He has a, a lot of tutorials, a lot of videos, and a lot of um, blogs and presentations on on Azure Function, especially durable functions. So um, I think this shows that he's on 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 a, on a right track. And um, now Microsoft is. Uh, yeah, named a leader here in this Forrester wave. So I think that's definitely something to uh, uh, take a look at if you, if you have not yet started um, to use Azure Functions. In this blog um, from um, Jeff Holland, there are also um, several links to um, tutorials or, or um, learning paths. So I think that's, that's uh, a really good way to get started with this. Talking about um, tutorials and uh, learnings, um, the Microsoft Graph um, has now um, um, an entry in the in the Microsoft Learn section. And I mean, I, I think we talked about the Microsoft Graph. There's this Graph Explorer, which allows you to um, test um, um, functionalities from the graph to, to query your emails, to query um, documents that you have access to in SharePoint, or to just retrieve your your picture from the Azure Active Directory. And now with this um, new Microsoft Learn path, um, there, there's really a nice tutorial that guides you through all these steps. So um, there's an introductional course um, that talks about um, what is the Microsoft Graph. And then there, there are also courses that then say, well, well, let's build an application. Let's build a JavaScript application that uses um, the graph to retrieve information here to access um, photo information there. So I think it's, um, it's really nicely done and, and gives a good introduction of what you can actually do um, with the Microsoft Graph. Um, sometime back, we had actually um, created also a tutorial with SAP that showed how from within an SAP Fiori application, and you could retrieve data from the SAP side, but then at the same point in time, you can um, leverage this information then to also query the Microsoft Graph and um, show the end user um, yeah, a mixture of data coming from SAP and data coming from the Microsoft Graph, I think, which was um, a pretty nice nice example. We're matching product IDs, right? As if someone was referring to a specific product and then you were finding the emails associated with it. Yeah, that was quite nice. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So in one key feature there, obviously, was the authentication. <laughs> So how do you authenticate and, and uh, connect them to the Microsoft Graph? And luckily, there's another um, blog post that talks about um, 
using the um, Microsoft um, Authentication Library, MSAL, um, that you can use in, in this specific um, demo from a, from a Node.js application. And basically what, what we're doing there, or what, what this library allows you to do is um, have a, yeah, any application, and again, the, the example here is with a, with a Node um, application, um, that you integrate this library, which allows you to authenticate um, using Azure Active Directory. And then with this authentication in place, you can then, for example, query um, an API from the graph, uh, from the Microsoft graph and, and retrieve some information there. So um, I think this is a beautiful extension of the um, of this Microsoft Learn scenario with the Microsoft graph. <laughs> and here we're talking about um, the, the authentication um, that you can use against Azure Active Directory. Good, then um, one more thing um, for the German speaking audience or for the German speaking partners, actually, we have an upcoming um, partner round table, um, Gemeinsam, Embracen and Reisen. Uh, so um, it's all about Embrace and uh, the Rise with SAP. It's, it's more um, it's English a, than German there. Gemeinsam, yes. Reisen. The English. The English. The English. <laughs> English, yeah. So English, I, yeah. I have to admit, I, I don't know who created the subtitle, but um, the important thing is um, we will have a good forum there um, of um, speakers on the on the SAP uh, on the on the Microsoft side. Um, I know we already have quite a few partners um, signed up there. So I think if you are available on April thirteenth, um, so in four weeks or whatever, um, and you can spare the the afternoon here. Um, I think it's definitely worth um, checking out. Then one final thing that um, just came in more or less. Um, so again, for the German speaking audience, um, the, the DSAC um, yearly Congress um, uh, is now again a live event. So uh, although this is only in, in, in September, I think um, DSAC already now um, said that this would be um, a virtual event, so not on site. I think it's good that um, there's this clarification very early on. Um, maybe, hopefully, the situation will be much better in, in September, but I still think um, making this decision now that this is going to be a virtual event um, is also really helpful because now, obviously, you can prepare, you can submit um, sessions and stuff like that. So I think uh, that's that's really good, and I'm 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 looking forward to this virtual event. Good. So with this, um, again, this was a quick uh, recap of this year. And now, actually, I would like to hand over to, to Martin. Um, again, I, I guess most of the audience here from the podcast already know you, but still you can quickly introduce yourself. And then I'm really looking forward to um, yet another topic that you're covering. So this time, really the blue-green deployments. Um, yeah, with the business technology platform. So over to you, Martin. So Martin, just be careful. Uh, today is 1st of April. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we and you have some uh, some some jokes there in, in your pocket covered already. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Never trust Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will watch out for that. Yeah, yeah, like last week, Martin Pancras, I'm part of um, an organization within Microsoft that um, helps with roller projects. So I actually um, a part of the journey for the customer until go live yeah, for our software measure projects. And as part of that, I um, have a passion for integration topics. And um, there's also some development since I started my professional journey uh, as a professional software developer. And uh, that's why I like the topic that we have here for today. Okay, so we had a session in January, I think, yeah, with Daniel Meister, where he already introduced Azure DevOps, um, some of the aspects of Agile software development, right? Yep. And there were some some staging strategies mentioned. And I'd like to start <laughs> with a quick recap of that. So let me share my screen here. And um, the, the, the staging is very often in the SAP world, uh, influenced how transporting works on the SAP backend. Yeah, and I put here like a typical setup, yeah, where you have a couple of um, stages of SAP systems yeah, that are represented by those boxes here, and uh, your your code moves from the development into some 
quality assurance system, then there's user acceptance tests, and maybe this is then already split into other systems even because multiple subsidiaries of your company have different needs. And um, then if they're all happy with it, then it goes into a pre-production and then a production. So this is a rather complicated setup, <clears throat> but not very uncommon. Yeah. <laughs> Usually we hope that the customer only has three stages, Yeah. <laughs> but it uh, doesn't have to be that case. And when you have- I've uh, seen a seven. Yeah, oh, seven, no, okay, good. Was it a bank or who was it? Oh, it was a SAP IT. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I think even at Microsoft IT, we have some Also, systems. they have a um, lot, yeah. Correct, yeah. Yes, and if you have something like this, the developer <clears throat> sends off his code here, and then it goes through several stages, and hopefully it makes its way to production. But you can imagine that those many stages with a different approval processes, testing, handover to multiple people, different departments, explaining what it does, documentation, this takes weeks, months, and sometimes in very complex scenarios, it could take the whole year yeah, until this makes its way into production. And by then it's already outdated. It was wrong in the middle already or not needed anymore. Yeah. So what all modern software development release strategies, yeah, when we talk about the CI CD that Daniel introduced in January, uh, try to get this process much, much leaner, much quicker to notice very early on if what you developed is actually meeting the requirements. Yeah. And maybe just just a recap. I mean, I I, I forgot to mention that, but um, since you, you you talked about the uh, podcast from um, from January with with Daniel, the idea there was to really show how using Azure DevOps um, we can transport objects um, within the SAP Cloud Platform or within different um, accounts that you had in the SAP Cloud Platform. So so there were um, uh, Daniel had created some um, pipelines in Azure DevOps that would then um, do the deployment and everything um, in the SAP Cloud Platform. Exactly. I uh, opened the video at that section again, so we can have a quick look here. Uh, he resembles um, this kind of strategy also on the SAP Business Technology Platform sub-account level, yeah, where you have certain spaces then um, and where you move your code in the cloud platform uh, like you would do it with the transporting on the backends. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So as a one-to-one -one mapping there. Mm -hmm. But with modern release strategies, we would try to get much faster. Yeah? And in order to get faster, I'd like to show this here. So we, there, there are customers with modern web applications uh, who are able to release new software each day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is maybe not something that you need to achieve, uh, or maybe even if if you're able to do it, maybe it opens up new possibilities for you. Yeah. But just for now, let's imagine that you that you need to release very often, not not weeks, not months, like each day. Yeah. And to be able to do that, it's very important um, that there's no overhead and um, that you can test in a very uh, uh, production-like environment. Huh? And this is what all of those uh, pictures here represent. The, 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 the mechanism to test in the same production environment as your productive app. And the one we are going to look at today is this blue-green deployment mechanism here. Yeah? But there are also others which are very popular. The canary one here <laughs> is a term that's often used in computer science, um, where you have a very small a uh, set of end users using the new version. Yeah, like let's say this is like 2% of your productive traffic goes there so that in case there's something wrong or is it's it's bad or whatever, uh, that only a very small set of users gets annoyed. Yeah, so you don't mm -hmm. lose major parts of your um, of your pr product there. Yeah. And uh, if you get really sophisticated, uh, you can have two different implementations of the same feature maybe and then uh, have analysis running on those and then decide which one you like better no? in terms of performance or even uh, conversion rate. No? When the, did the customer understand better the UI flow, the, the, the what you were selling? And this really gives you then the power to decide which uh, implementation you want to keep uh, afterwards. What is better, where you get better feedback and then, yeah. <clears throat> exactly, yeah. And then there's the feature flagging. 
um, where you also move your new code into production, but you give the power uh, to the user to decide if you want to be on the preview uh, version of this, and then he has an understanding of he gets the new latest and greatest, but there's a chance there might be glitches or there might be problems. And in case he has problems, he just hits off. I don't want this anymore and gets the stable version. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you by any chance know um, when we look, for example, at Office 365? Um, mm -hmm. I know I think in, in some areas, for example, there is this um, feature flag functionality that you can activate some, some new functionalities. Obviously, we have the different rings um, um, that are available, so you can join a uh, beta ring or whatever and, and benefit from some of the functionalities there. I, I guess with the Office team, we, we have a mixture of, of different um, rollout strategies, right? Yeah, so it really depends on, uh, on your audience, huh? what you can, uh, what they can bear. Yeah. <laughs> Me, for instance, I'm on the uh, beta uh, ring for uh, Teams. Um, so um, I get the, the latest and greatest, but I also get bugs, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I'm aware of that, so that, that's why it's okay. No? But yeah. if yeah. this is business critical to you and uh, you, you need to run this in the most critical demo meeting you're going to have in your life, you don't want to be on the beta phase, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So bear in mind, this the target of all those mechanisms is to uh, ha release code into production right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no <laughs> dev QA UAT. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're actually deleting all of this. Yeah. None of this anymore. We release into production and then we test there. Yeah. That, that this is where we test because then we get immediate feedback. Is this useful? Does it work? Does it make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to mitigate risk, um, because many uh, those those um, mechanisms require downtime, uh, the very easiest way of getting rid of downtime is blue green deployments, yeah? where you deploy the systems in a new version, mm -hmm. but um, not released under the same URL, so they get a different separate space where they can be tested, but they already run in the same environment that the productive version runs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a small project, which is a UI5 project. And this is also released on GitHub. Uh, because last time Daniel was showing the SAP Business Application Studio, uh, so it would work the very same uh, way from there. I can actually show the same code loaded here. Yeah. So I could do the very same thing also from here. It doesn't matter because GitHub is my code base. Yeah, I, and I get to choose which uh, client I want to work with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So down here, um, we have a description of this view. And I already prepared uh, a UI change that we're going to introduce. Mm -hmm. And when we check the app in its current state, <clears throat> so this is the business technology platform. See, the name's already changed here. Yeah. <laughs> and we have this app with the name UI and the productive route here, which uh, shows a really simple UI5 app which loads a screen. Yeah, and there's right. uh, the button that we have at the moment. And now we're going to add a new button. Well, to say, and we want to uh, see that change uh, going mm -hmm. through this this mechanism that we just described before. And again, so, so in a classic SAP approach, you would now deploy this to a QA environment. You would have QA testers doing this. And um, then once this change is tested, you would release it and um, put it in production and so on. And now exactly. what we're doing is we're, we're deploying it directly to production. Yes. But you will see we're going to have two versions of our app. Mm -hmm. I just triggered the build process and um, we are going to see here when we go into our development space, I'm going to get two versions of my UI app, one routing, keeping the productive traffic and another one uh, which has the uh, new version under a new URL. So if I'm a, a normal user, I would, even though the new version is now already deployed, 
I would still continue to to access my uh, the the old version, so to say. So I still only see one button, but the newer version is already deployed in parallel. I just don't know it yet. Exactly. That's the core of blue green. The the version two is not yet visible to the to the productive audience. Mm -hmm. um, but it's running in the same environment, and if you know where to get it, um, then you can start working with it. Yeah? Perfect, yeah. So then let's see what our build pipe is doing. I already opened it here, right? Let's, let's see the, the process. So you see the process running here, uh, the build is going. So again, just to recap there, so um, you, you saved, uh, your, you published this now to GitHub, and your Azure DevOps pipeline is configured in a way that it basically monitors changes in GitHub. So there exactly. was now a change in GitHub. So that's why the pipeline um, is started. And now you're doing going through the whole um, pipeline steps here in Azure DevOps. Exactly. <laughs> and um, I'm using the classical uh, way of the pipeline because it's um, uh, UI driven. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you can do this uh, with plug and play, drag and drop. Usually we would recommend doing this the YAML way that Daniel described in January mm -hmm. because it's um, more flexible in terms of coding and you get more. Um, it ensures that uh, you always have the same versioning of the how the pipeline is configured and described as your code yeah, because they're versioned together. Here um, there, there could be a disconnect yeah, when you make changes here and yeah. revert code, for instance. Yeah? Yeah. But for the purpose of today, uh, this is much easier to comprehend yeah, because you see the different steps and the configurations here in a UI driven way. And I think it's also nice to really similar like you you um, you, you said uh, with Daniel, we did the development in the business application studio, but you did it in Visual Studio Code. So I think similar, it's nice to see here that there are just different ways how you can do this. You can do it the YAML way or you can do it the visual way. And yeah. in, in the end, uh, the the results are are similar. You you have a pipeline in Azure DevOps that allows you to deploy um, your resources or your applications then to the business technology platform. <clears throat> exactly, and you can see the YAML representation here. Eh? If you want to then go into details eh? and maybe uh, move into the YAML way afterwards eh? at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we uh, need to retrieve the build tools so we can build the MTA project. Yeah? So mm -hmm. the SAP provides this um, on, on their uh, repo under the cloud MTA build tools. We're downloading this, we're extracting it, um, we're putting there the, the commands, and in the end we're saying, please build my project. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then we are publishing this to the next uh, pipelines. Huh? So we have one set of pipelines doing the uh, build of the project, so the continuous integration part. And then we have release pipes, which then uh, do the, the release, like they described. So, but our process here, okay, it finished. It finished. So, so we should see <coughs> here that it's already doing the, the idle parts. So we see here it's already running my stages. And I called them idle, review, and live because we're going to use a couple of uh, um, Cloud Foundry CLI commands and we need to orchestrate them. Yeah? <laughs> so the whole thing, how we implemented the, the blue green process is described by SAP. And uh, it can all be done with four Cloud Foundry CLI commands. Yeah? Let's go here. So what we're seeing here, it's downloading the MTAR file that our build process created. And it's now logging in into my business technology platform account and in my dev space. And it's already noticing a couple of things where it sees, ah, okay, I see this application UI. So for the blue green process, now I need to rename this to UI live. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the one which has the new version is this UI idle. Yeah? And it's already scaling it and staging it, which is all native to Cloud Foundry. Yeah. And we'll see in the in the description here. Let me quickly show you the code. It's really only a couple of lines. <laughs> there we go. So I'm installing the Cloud Foundry CLI. Yeah, that's what I need to do to run those commands. 
Then I'm adding a specific plugin, which SAP uh, ships, and they describe what it does. Then mm -hmm. I'm retrieving the mtar file. And here's the login command, which you saw on the logs. And then here's the special minus minus <laughs> strategy uh, yeah. blue green uh, command that we need to actually kick off this process. Yeah, so cool. this, this is the only thing that you need. CF deploy, mtar file name, I want blue green. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what we, if you quickly go back to the business technology platform there, we saw that the app name was originally UI. Yeah. And now exactly, yeah. And now we we can see it. that's what you just sh has shown us have shown us in in the, in the logs. Now mm -hmm. instead of having one application with the name UI, we have two applications with UI Live and UI Idle. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the productive URL didn't change. <laughs> yeah. So we it's still running under this. Yeah. So if I refresh this, it will still show us that one icon here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No productive user was impacted. Cool. If you now check this UI idle part, <laughs> we get a new URL. Yeah, you see there's the, this, uh, this suffix minus idle. Mm -hmm. And if we go there, we're going to see that phone icon that I introduced. Cool, really nice. So, so basically now with, so, so um, yeah, just take a step back. Um, the, the old, the original URL is still the same. So again, any user, um, that is using this application will don't won't see any difference. It will just work as before. But now I could start distributing this new URL to better testers like yourself, for example. Mm -hmm. And you could test it. You could provide feedback. You <laughs> could see if it's working and and so on. And um, yeah, and and I could maybe even roll it out or, or share this link then with more and more of my colleagues just to get additional feedback and and let them test. Exactly. And uh, in the meantime, the the process of um, staging this finished. Yeah, so we see the log. Where was it? Here. So the the whole process finished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, all all green. Yeah. And it says now it's it's all okay. And it all the uh, the California CLI already tells me what I can do next. Yeah. So it's now in the stage where it expects uh, further action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now it's telling me you can use CF deploy minus abort or resume to finish or abort the process. Yeah. But we're not going to do that just now because we want to do the testing, right? So yeah. the pipeline, let's go here again. You see it's in the review stage here now. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Let me open it in this way to make it, make it more clear. So we set it up in a way that it's now uh, waiting for us to complete the test. <laughs> yeah. So there we put like a timeout for a couple of days, maybe, depending on how fast you expect the tester to come back to you to make a decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then based on this, you can decide if you want to resume or if you want to reject. Mm -hmm. So this is there's native integration for this now. Yeah. It tells you also some instructions. And in the meantime, I also got an email because I'm assigned as the tester. And then you get something like uh, like this, where you can describe um, in in a in a text what's expected of you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can go from here to the uh, to the process where you accept or reject the, yeah. And then you get a description where this came from and what this is doing. Perfect. So. Uh... Um, you just said you are registered as a as a tester. So basically, um, once the deployment um, was finished, or the the idle is is basically we are in this in this review step um, mm -hmm. that you as a tester would have been notified. And I guess this this could have been a group of testers or whatever. Yeah. Um, so you are testing um, the solution. Everything is working fine, and now you can come back here, and then basically, yeah resume or reject your, your findings. Exactly. So I'm now the powerful person who is going to uh, say, yeah, this is good to go to production. Looks good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, sounds so optimistic. So this is now resuming and triggers then automatically the, the live step of this. And this is now going to Clean, clean up 
the uh, or like complete the blue green process, meaning the staging will go and put the new version on under the live traffic, and mm -hmm. uh, clean up the the idle part of this. Yeah, so you will we will end up with the UI uh, app here like we started. Yeah? But with the new version, how, how fast is this replacement? Because I I mean I guess I have I should have all the components running now in the business technology platform. So wow, I, I would assume that it's just a, um, changing the routing so that now um, the target, uh, the, the original URL points to the new version and then I can just delete the old one or undeploy the old one. See, this... mine, the idle stopped already, uh, live update. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's some, some updates there, but we can see on the logs what is actually happening. Okay, it's logged in again, detected a new version, and it's updating the application mm -hmm. and going through all the steps necessary um, for the with the Cloud Foundry CLI. And let's have a look at the coding so that you get a feeling for the, the effort and the complexity. Mm -hmm. So we now, before we check the idle stage, right? So now we go here to the live stage. We again need to CLI, you know, since yeah. the, this is like in, independent of each other and in certain uh, runtime environments. So here we also do the login again and we're retrieving the ID of the blue bean process that we initiated before. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to uh, run the command that the log showed us before for resuming. Yeah? And the only like cleverness that we need is the finding the this hashed ID uh, for the process before. Yeah? That's why we have this uh, retrieval logic in here. Cool. So it would be even better if Cloud Foundry would <laughs> provide an API for, for this purpose. And I believe in the native Cloud Foundry deployment, uh, it is already there or at least on the roadmap, but I haven't seen uh, SAP adopting it yet. Yeah? So you wrote this small PowerShell script to get the status or it was kind of provided no, you, you get it provided by by this okay. command. Yeah? Okay. Cloud Foundry MTI minus ops is part of the of the plugin that SAP ships, and you provide the name of of your uh, entire deployment, and then it tells you uh, it gives you actually a table outprint. Yeah, and uh, I'm using this match to get the ID from the table. That's it. But you are you are handling this by yourself. I mean, you you put this additional part of the code, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, that's what I meant. Yeah. Question. What about rollback? Good question, Robert. But is it Next a point joke or is it, do you mean it for, for... <laughs> <laughs> It's now for real, yeah? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Remember before we clicked on the UI, we said resume, yeah? And actually I was acting upon this manual intervention job on the review stage, yeah? I okay. moved now back to the, to the review stage, right? And uh, when you look at this view, it's the same as going from here to here, right? Mm -hmm. So on the manual intervention, we said resume. But if I say reject, yeah, then if then this process fails, and then this job here runs, yeah, because it's set up to only run when the previous job failed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you click reject, this job gets executed. So in here, we're doing the same logic as before, but instead of resuming, we're triggering a board. Okay. But I guess is, more question is is it is my, my question was going in direction when I uh, when I deployed it already and I discover later because I was lazy, I discover later that I have still have some bugs and I want to do the rollback from what I submit already. Is there any option to do that? Well that's um again to the uh no in the pipeline question. Oh, no. Yes. Because the, the the mechanism we are now employing does not uh, like rollback. Yeah? There's even terms or hashtags on the community where they say there's there's no rollback. There's always beta. In case you have yeah, a problem, okay, yeah. you, you just send uh, you send the update because you're releasing every day. Yeah. You're not rolling back. You're sending the fix yeah, or the change. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. But but in, uh, okay, this is pipeline question. So I can say okay, I will I will do the rollback in a way that I will decide in which version I want to return. Actually, I will propagate like a new new version, but it's actually rollback to old one. Yeah. So this is just pipeline logic. Yeah. yeah, you could do it that way, exactly. I mean, GitHub, you, you obviously have the whole history, I guess. So yeah, yes. exactly, exactly. Yeah. But you're, you're still right, Robert. Now we see implementations of Blue Green, uh, where, let me retrieve from here, 
where you keep version one uh, for a time. And then in case if you really want to go back, you can then uh, change the routing back to yeah. the version one. Yeah. But in the implementation and how we orchestrated it for this purpose right now, that doesn't work. You need to be sure yeah? because the other, the other version, the other route is gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the same what we have with uh, application services in Azure with deployment slots, uh, where we can uh, select the deployment slots. Uh, so you can have a production deployment slots and testing yep. deployment slots, and you are just switching them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this, this is this yeah, modern way of, of development and should should be like that. Yeah. And if you want yeah. that, you, you can still have it. Yeah? But then you yeah. need other Cloud Foundry CLI commands because you can yeah. uh, reroute yourself. Yeah? But if you use the built-in uh, blue-green strategy module that we are orchestrating here in our example, then mm -hmm. it will be this way. Yeah? So then there's always beta or uh, no rollback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So far, so good. We should see, yeah, this is the, the result. Idle is gone, new version, UI. So this is the, the old one. Let me quickly get the disable cache and refresh. Yeah, I had the breakpoint there. Go ahead. There you go. The icon is productive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Very nice. Very nice. <clears throat> and as, as a small treat for you guys today, I also did the feature flagging. Okay. It's already, it's already incorporated. And uh, there are a couple of uh, providers for feature flag management. And mm -hmm. I picked one which was free, which we had natively supported by Azure DevOps. So we can also um, see how to manage uh, feature flags if we want to. No? So and for that purpose, I uh, made a quick uh, sign up here with Optimizely and created this uh, feature flag for my phone icon. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in here you can uh, create a couple of options. You can come up with rules. And the whole idea of this is that you can um, uh, manage multiple flags, have certain user groups, and also analysis on top of this. Huh? Because for the um, for something like the A-B testing here, yeah, you need, need the possibility to uh, understand which one is used, how often, by whom, and um, how does it work yeah, mm -hmm. to run experiments on this? Mm -hmm. And um, software providers like Optimizely, they give you the, um, the framework for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I downloaded their SDK and I went into my code in here. So you see here my Optimizely client instance. And this is checking now if the phone feature is enabled for this user. And if it is, it's going to enable and if not, it's going to disable the, the okay. icon. Yeah. So that means now when we go into Optimizely, we see now my uh, my phone feature flag <coughs> is is um, disabled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in production. No. Oh. So in production, which which one I configured, it's, it's enabled for everyone, no? which is what we expect to see, because my code is checking is it, it, yeah. is it enabled, and we can see on my here it's it's not great or so it's enabled, yeah. So if we are now changing and optimizing the setting, so I'm flagging this off, then I need to save something or is it done directly? I think so. Okay. Yeah. So I'm managing now my features from from this platform, right? Uh -huh. And if you refresh the page now. The disable cache. So mm. there is there can be some delay, but let's see if it works already. There you go. It's now disabled. it's straight out. Yeah. Nice. So I, I added feature flagging <laughs> with uh, like another four lines of code. Yeah. Cool. I, I actually think, I mean, um, now you're using this uh, third party solution. Isn't yes. there a feature, or I, I think there was a feature flagging functionality with the SAP Cloud Platform once. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it's still there. And I have to admit, I don't know, on Azure, we, we, we don't have such a functionality for feature flags. 
I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Well, in the DevOps space, there's multiple providers. Um, for specific to the cloud platform, uh, actually, I didn't stumble upon it, but we could research. Might be a good uh, comment for the after the video under the comments section. Mm -hmm. um, I ran into Optimizely because it was rather prominent on um, on the tasks here because I was just okay. searching there and I uh, came across it. Cool. And um, if you add it here, you can see that you get a nice uh, representation of um, how to work with this. Uh, you, can, you can choose mm -hmm. if you want to work with feature flagging or if you want to do experiments for A-B testing, then you define your experiment here and then it can already be part of your release process. Yeah? Cool. And you have That's that from really multiple nice. providers. Yeah. And then obviously, I mean, then you, so you um, added it here in the pipeline, but then obviously you also needed to include it. Yeah, as, as you said, um, the, the SDK in your code, and then you could um, define that this um, telephone icon there should be grayed out if the feature is not active. Yes, and um, th this is like all or nothing approach yeah, with one button. Mm -hmm. But usually um, when we look at the this picture here many of the feature flagging mechanisms um, they also give you the, the opportunity to have a subset of users being exposed mm -hmm. to that flag yeah and this is all supported then by the, the framework and the sdk it's only about you to configure this on the on the coding side then yeah, yeah that was uh, because i was part of researching I don't, I don't remember i think our application get we had the same option where you can decide okay which uh, percentage of of user will go with with that new functionality and uh, with all functionality so you can but it can balance testing yeah i think or, or load balance i don't remember anymore but one of our services can do also that i think yeah. it's traffic manager yeah. traffic manager this traffic it is traffic manager huh? yeah so this very nice feature where i can balance when i want to test something yeah Actually, um, you could even achieve something like the Canary with the Azure Traffic Manager. Then. If you put that in front of the um, app that we were just looking at uh, in, in this technology platform, then we would need two instances, and then we could set up Traffic Managers to do the 5% or the 1% oh, okay. thing. Yeah. Okay, great. Really so nice. First. And the, the last thing to conclude this topic, is we were only talking about UI and some logic. Yeah? But of course, the bottleneck to this is uh, your database at the end. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, you need to be able to work with breaking changes yeah? mm -hmm. because changes to data structures can uh, break the interface, mm -hmm. which you don't care too much about if you do downtime deployments yeah, because you just take everything down, you make the changes mm -hmm. and see if, if it works again and you bring everything back up. But with the, all the process that we described today, you do everything live, no downtimes. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that if you have a breaking change in the database, that both mm -hmm. versions, which rely on different structures, they can still live next to each other? Okay. And that process is well understood and well described for multiple years already. And it's uh, known as the expand and contract pattern mm -hmm. or a parallel change. Yeah. I think that's last from the old days. There's a blog that I referenced here from Martin Fowler. And if you look into web services and stuff like that, you will see him a lot. He describes in detail how this works. And there's also very there's a lot of blog posts on, on this topic. And um, what I want to show here is that you need to be aware that if you have database structure changes, um, that you need to go through multiple releases mm -hmm. to make sure that it gets introduced and the clients get changed and it gets phased out again. Mm -hmm. And in this release process, you need four releases to production to make the change. Yeah? And if you release, let's say, in a typical Scrum process once a month, it takes for you four months until the, the breaking change is gone. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's why there's even a saying, if you need longer than one month for a release, you shouldn't be employing this process, the, the blue-green or any of the zero downtime deployment processes because it takes too long for you to yeah, get mm -hmm. rid of, this, of the schema change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So each day is a good good release cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And, uh, 
Hannah has also some uh, uh, mechanism there. The, the SAP describes it on the docs, uh, also for the zero downtime deployment, and they have native support for aspects of this. So it might be worth checking your database um, that you were using with your app, um, how they treat this, those kind of things, if you need to incorporate yourself with uh, scripting for the schema changes, or if there's native support. And for HANA, we, we also see some uh, some aspects of this. Now you can see there's a resemblance between the, the releases here, the, the new and the current schema, and uh, how, how SAP treats this here now with the zero downtime maintenance of MTA applications. Mm -hmm. That shall be it. Great, perfect. Thank you. I think that's a that's a really beautiful continuation of the uh, uh, podcast that we had with Daniel, where we just made the introduction. And now I think you, you had a beautiful deep dive into some of the concepts, how this can be done. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that was very informative, I would say. There's like four or five Cloud Foundry CLI commands to get a very uh, complicated setup, but just at the tip, at your fingertips. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you need to know them. And I, I think that that's a beautiful introduction in the topic. Thank you. And Robert, mm -hmm. I'm still waiting for that April Fool's joke. Mm, no, I, I'm uh, I'm a nice guy today, so I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> not provocate. So, so let's start. Martin, you are becoming part of furniture for this uh, uh, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share I mean, those know, things. It's not a first April comment, but I think, you know, it's fascinating uh, how far this DevOps mentality, let's call it like that, everything is putting inside. It's going further because, you know, I think it's not a question, okay, how to how to establish that in today big teams. I think it's much more for me interesting to see that Today, one man bands, so to say, you know, few guys with all those tooling and all those processes can do a huge amount of task, which before you need, you know, 100 developers. Almost, mm. yeah? Today, you don't need such such a huge team because you have so nice tool where you can, you know, go further test, roll, roll back and so on. And you are much more flexible. Of course, you need to have a, a discipline uh, to, to, to execute in small steps. Is the the biggest requirement, but it's fascinating how how these those tools are helping us to be much more productive. It's very interesting. To me, the like, biggest challenge will be the S4 strategy on keeping the core clean. Yeah, where yeah. they encourage you to have this on the business technology platform, your changes, but it doesn't do the same speed on the backends. To coming up with strategies um, to make sure that you can uh, cater for that. Yeah, maybe the data service doesn't change, so yeah, you're lucky you can release, but mm -hmm. if it does. Do you need to create a mock service and then maybe a feature flag to tell the yeah, customers yeah. or the, the end user, well, this is the new feature, but it's not live yet. But you see it still and it gives you in, like in mock data, but it's not live. No? So really mm -hmm. tell it red, this this is not live, yeah, but we needed it so that we can move through the levels. You know? Nice, nice, cool. very nice. Always interesting to listen to something like that. Exactly, and I, I'm I'm looking forward to the next topic. And uh, we, we're striking off now some of the areas that you are allowed to talk about. So you need to find something new, Martin. And then, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really great. And I, I mean, I, I loved your presentation about the the power platform. I love the, the the previous discussions that we had, and now here in in the DevOps area. Honestly, I, I'm really looking forward to the next thing um, that you can share with us. Um, I'm I'm sure it will be again very. Uh, very exciting. Yeah, doing my very best. Thank you. Perfect. Good. Then with this, I think um, we can close the call uh, for today. Thank you, everyone, for for joining. Special thanks again to, to to Martin for coming on the show, and we'll see each other next week again. Yep. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Have a nice Thank day. You. Bye. bye.